the Dementia Researcher podcast, talking careers, research, conference highlights, and so much more. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Dementia Researcher podcast. This week, we're going to be exploring the Brains Border Patrol and discussing the blood-brain barrier, some exciting new discoveries, and its importance in the dementia research. So let's get going. Hello, I'm Dr Fiona McLean. I'm an Alzheimer's Research UK Fellow at the University of Dundee and it's great to be back guest hosting the show and exploring one of my favourite topics. Joining me are two amazing scientists who share my passion. I'm delighted to welcome Dr Kate Harris from Newcastle University and Dr Sophie Morse from the UK Dementia Research Institute at Imperial College London. Hi both. Hello. Hi. So let's, let's do some proper introductions. Sophie, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yes, of course. So uh, I'm a research fellow based at Imperial College in London, and I'm split between the Department of Bioengineering and the Department of Brain Sciences, where the UK Dementia Research Institute at Imperial is based. And my background, I'm a biomedical engineer, um, and most of my work is uh, focused on using focused ultrasound as a way to perform therapy in the brain, um, and in particular to temporarily open the blood-brain barrier so that we can get drugs into uh, regions of the brain where we need to get them to. That's so cool. And did you, so for your sort of undergraduate degrees, did you come from the engineering route or was it biology or was it an actual sort of focused uh, degree that was bioengineering? Yeah, it was focused degree in biomedical engineering. Yes, yes. It was, it was at the very beginning of when they introduced them into the country and it was sort of a bit of a test. <laughs> it was, oh, yeah. it's worked out. <laughs> it, was, it sounds really, really cool. And Kate, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, okay, yeah. Um, so I'm a research fellow up at Newcastle University. Um, and similar to Sophie, I'm kind of split between two fields. So I, I have labs in the chemistry department and in the medical school, um, doing chemistry and then cellular neuroscience. Um, and I guess our thing is about trying to improve translation in neurodegenerative disease drug discovery. So um, finding new targets or drugging current targets better, or even just looking at different cell types, we're particularly interested in inflammation at the moment. Thank you so much. It's great to have you both join me today. For those of you who have listened to the show before, you'll know exactly why I'm so excited to be hosting this one. And this is because this area of research is also what I work in. And just to give a little bit of background on myself, um, I work on the blood-brain barrier as well. And historically, I've been doing a lot of work to understand how obesity and type 2 diabetes can change the blood-brain barrier and cause breakdown and dysfunction with a particular focus on what changes in transport mechanisms. And currently, with my Alzheimer's Research UK Fellowship, I'm building on that work to better understand how amyloid buildup in the blood-brain barrier can affect it and also then investigate the links with altered metabolic status. So it's so great to have three people who work on the blood-brain barrier. As I said, it's one of uh, my favourite things. So let's uh, dig into your research a little bit more. So Kate, can you give us sort of a 101 on the blood-brain barrier and why it's important? <laughs> I can try. Um, I think the thing, main thing about the blood-brain barrier is it's currently the bane of my life because um, <laughs> I keep trying to get drugs through it. Um, no, it's a really important um, thing. And it's um, basically, I never really know exactly how to describe it without saying the word barrier, which seems a bit lame. But <laughs> um, basically, the blood cell, the blood vessels surrounding your brain have a really, really thick, tightly wedged together layer of cells that stop most things getting through unless they are specifically permitted. I am sure Sophie can do much better than that. <laughs> No, 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 that was great. <laughs> it's a barrier. It's a barrier. <laughs> Clues in the name. Um. I always like 
like to think of it, um, I use the analogy a lot of it's like a bouncer on a nightclub door and it sort of lets the good things in, kicks the trash yeah. out and it, it sort of, that, I like that's that. the way, the way I, I always kind of I think of it more like cling film. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Any other sort of kitchen goods that you can compare it to? It's not quite tinfoil. So oh, no, no. No, no. <laughs> so, Sophie, how do you kind of think of the blood being bad when you... No, in a it? similar way. I suppose, actually, um, yeah, I sort of almost feel like it's... Uh, I suppose, actually, I've sort of shown it in diagrams as, as a wall and gaps in between the wall and it's kind of it's it's like in the rest of the body the gaps are filled in with cement oh actually no sorry it's the other way around <laughs> uh, in the rest of the body it's filled in with like i don't know some earthy water uh, watery or earth oh god and everything the wrong way around um but um in the brain it's a lot more sort of yeah something not quite as tight as cement maybe and as much of a barrier but that kind of image comes up in my mind yeah, I think one of the key things is it's super selective um, and there's not many places in the body that have a similar kind of barrier. The two that I can think of are the eye, the retina, which is interesting because it's also thought of as kind of a central nervous system um, component. Uh, so yeah, the blood retina barrier is probably the other thing that's similar. And then the other barrier that is kind of comparable in how selective it is, is the placenta. Um, so I, I've actually been speaking to researchers who work on the eye and the placenta a bit more and trying to understand how these barriers have similarities but also differences. But I love the barrier. I just think it's so cool at how it can be so selective and let certain things in but also manage to keep certain things out and how it's not just to do with the size of the things that are trying to get over or out. It's also to do with, you know, just properties of those mm -hmm. molecules. Can we quiz the podcast host? <laughs> me yes oh. of course you can oh, this is not how this is meant to go <laughs> we're turning the tables on you no, i just really want to know what happens on a high fat diet to the blood brain ba barrier right so this is oh, see, oh, i need to get my paper out it, it's really, so i've worked with two mouse models previously one which is a high fat diet mouse um and I also worked with a mouse which is known as the DBDB mouse. So the high fat diet mouse gets obese and mildly hyperglycemic, not like mildly, just a little bit above it. Um, so it's almost like a pre-diabetic model. And then the DBDB mouse is a leptin receptor mutation. And um, so it doesn't have proper leptin signaling. Um, and for those of you who don't know what leptin is about, it is basically known as like the hunger, a hunger hormone. So it regulates how hungry you get. So these mice get super hungry, they get super hyperglycemic, and they get really obese as well. Um, so they're more of a model of uncontrolled type 2 diabetes. And without going into too much detail, what we kind of are seeing is, um, so my work in particular focuses on endothelial cells, which are the main cells that sit in the blood-brain barrier. And they so they're kind of, if we go back to, some of the analogies, like there may be the bricks in the wall. Um, and those um, cells, we see actually not that many changes in the high fat diet model. So when it's just kind of obesity, it's not actually too many changes. But with the DBDB mouse, so when we have obesity with hyperglycemia, there is so many changes. Um, and right now I'm kind of unpicking that. So I, I use a technique called single cell sequencing to really understand like the changes that are going on in not just endothelial cells, but that the different types of endothelial cells, so capillary or vein or arterial. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, we need to talk <laughs> off this podcast, please. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I love talking. So yeah, so that that's, it, I think it's fascinating. Um, and yeah, we're working to look for some, maybe some targets um, in these cells that we could maybe then try and manipulate to improve the barrier function. Um, so yeah, but it's not me who's getting quizzed. So <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna uh, take this back. Although I could, I love speaking about my research. <laughs> but let's go back to um, to you guys. So first of all, I'd like to know of how the understanding of the blood-brain barrier's role in dementia has changed over the last few years. Sophie, what do you think? Well, 
I, I mean, essentially, we've gotten better imaging tools to actually yeah. visualise how leaky or not the blood-brain barrier is in various different types of dementia, and actually found out things like that the plaques and the proteins that aggregate in the brain actually and the vascular problems lead to sort of damage to the blood vessels and leakiness um, and essentially that brings toxin more toxins into the brain that normally wouldn't get there um, but also um, leads to actually interestingly peripheral immune cells um, coming into the brain and sort of lead into maybe Kate has more information on this side uh, perhaps the neuroinflammation state but sort of exasperates that neuroinflammation state to some extent as well there's a lot more information about how to uh, well how uh, the integrity of the blood-brain barrier changes with dementias and also um, techniques to as to how people are working on techniques to try and restore the blood-brain barrier as well um, but yeah fantastic and Kate, what do you think sort of changed in the last five, ten years in the blood-brain barrier field? Oh, gosh, that's a question, isn't it? Um, which Sophie's answered beautifully. Um, I think the thing that stands out most, I guess, for me is it's probably going to be different for every neurodegenerative disease. So obviously what Sophie was saying about um, peripheral immune cells getting in, um, that's a classic issue with um, multiple sclerosis um maybe in other situations that degradation is slower or happens after actually the disease causing pathology is already undertaken so we really don't understand i don't think as much in things like alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia or i guess maybe some of the lesser well characterized ones where they're very common but we're still like what on earth is going on pathologically mm, in these yeah. diseases so I still haven't decided if it's a good or a bad thing in general, um, probably both, certainly in terms of drug discovery, um, <laughs> it can be a real pain. Yeah. But oh, um, Well, we'll maybe come back to it later, but we were having a bit of a discussion before the recording started about is it a good or bad thing that you can open the blood brain barrier? But we'll maybe come on to that in a little it's bit. It's going to be a good debate. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before we get on to that, I think, Kate, you might have something to say on this because you said the blood-brain barrier is the bane of your life. <laughs> so what, what are some of the biggest challenges that you face when studying the blood-brain barrier in relation to dementia research? So, uh, I guess from a drug discovery perspective, um, it can be quite challenging to design drugs that are going to get into the brain. Now, it is not impossible, not by any means, and I probably hyped up the bane of my life a little bit, but the number <laughs> of times that we've got really excited about a potential drug and then we've looked at it and gone, oh, no, that's not getting in. Oh, no. <laughs> like, I mean, it's not. And the thing is, is I don't know how much you guys know about properties and drug discovery, but actually we live by a set of guidelines pretty much. But those guidelines are based on what people have observed in the past mm. rather than mm. actually... So there's these, it's this amazing set of rules called Lipinski's rules, where a group of people actually sat down and went, every drug that's ever been dosed orally up to this point, what were their properties? And it's a guidelines to follow. But there's always a subset that completely defy the laws of that and get in. Mm -hmm. So you never quite Oof. know. Um, Interesting. <laughs> and the one rules the... are more stringent for blood-brain barrier penetrants. One, one of the, um, actually one of the main things on the project that I worked on with the diabetes work was they didn't just want to know what was changing in a whole range of models actually and um, it was a um, a Euro big European grant so there was uh. different people looking at different diseases but they didn't want to know just what was changing they actually wanted to know what wasn't changing mm. because sometimes they were getting like I say sometimes they as in the, the drug company people and um, because we had a lot of drug partners and um, they were finding that they were getting drugs through clinical research that were looking really good and um, they even got them into healthy individuals they saw that they were getting into the brain but then when they moved them into people who had uh, neurodegenerative diseases suddenly they weren't getting in the brain anymore yeah. so a lot of our research was actually looking for transporters that were preserved in mm. these different diseases so that you could still use the transporters to get stuff into the That's brain so clever because i think a lot of misconception around blood brain barrier breakdown is that breakdown means that it becomes easier to get things into the brain which isn't incorrect but actually 
what also happens is there's a change in transporters. So sometimes you get an increased internalization of a transporter, um, for example, and then you can it's you can no longer get um, something that uses that transporter into the brain anymore, um, even if you also do have some physical breakdown of that barrier. So it's hugely complex, and I can see Sophie nodding away. So I'd love to hear your input on those <laughs> <Yeah>. thoughts. <laughs> no, I, I'd say the biggest challenge is the complexity of it all, right? Because you don't just study one cell type and uh, one specific transport. It's so complex. There's so many different layers to the barrier itself. And then I think the other complex thing about it is especially when using a technology like mine, where potentially you could use it for different diseases or different states, but every disease has got a different level of permeability of the blood-brain barrier, and yep. depending on the stage of the disease, it's different. And so you might be answering one question, which might apply to that specific scenario, but then it doesn't apply to others. And so it's all of that and, and really takes a long time to figure things out, yeah. Absolutely, I think you've both made sort of a, a great picture of why it is it is so complex and it's such a complex entity to study as well so just before we move on um how just for our listeners who aren't familiar with the blood brain barrier could you both maybe describe how the blood brain barrier can change with age versus how it changes in diseases such as Alzheimer's disease? I can try to answer. Well, I mean, we've talked about the permeability increasing, which it's not as simple as just permeability increasing, but essentially yeah. there is just more contact between what's inside of the brain and what's inside of the blood. And so there's more contact between that. And and I suppose that really can lead to lots of different things. Um, one is that toxic substances are getting in, and so they might be affecting neuronal function and lead to neuronal impact impairment um, but as Fiona was saying earlier the tricky thing is that it's not just fins going in and it, this concept of leakiness it's that the actual cells that normally transport fins across um, don't do that necessarily in the same way as before so as you age um, even nutrients like glucose and oxygen just have a lot harder time getting transported across and they're just not going through as efficiently and so you can even get um, sort of hypoxic regions and that kind of thing going and the other thing I'd mention is that drug efflux pumps like peak glycoprotein are just not expressed as higher concentration so that's also changing with age and I think more so with dementia so I, I guess those are the main things sort of changing with age. I got really excited when you mentioned glucose. <laughs> it's so important. Because like, we need to talk oh my metabolism. Goodness. Yes, I'm so happy to find some metabolism fans. Metabolism. Um, Can I be a loser and please just share one thing that we just that my most amazing students shared with me in the lab yesterday? Yes. Absolutely. Oh, hot, hot off hot. the bench. I don't. I mean, give me time because I, I. I mean, all I got was because uh, I'm. We're obviously discovering this, but we saw we were we were putting microglia. Um, we're treating them with actually sulfatide, the thing that makes up myelin sheaths, um, and looking for mitochondrial reactive oxygen species and we saw the mitochondria making these little teeny tunnels and like shifting oh. the microglia shifting their mi mitochondria through and we were like wait what? shifting from one mitochondria to another or from microglia to another yeah and there were these <gasps> little like dots in the oh in the... that's super exciting <laughs> so they were like shuttling the yeah. mitochondria between and the microglia with not with like 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 fats like lipopolysaccharides or Oof. other things it was just with sulfatide and i was like mm. what's it up to mm. wow. so that's really cool just wanted to share that they're amazing oh i love that mm. i love that literally nah. breakthroughs <laughs> you've heard all, when kate wins a nobel prize you heard it here <laughs> the, the beautiful zoe catchpole for making these images my amazing student because i oh, obviously didn't shout do out it to the student. <laughs> they never get enough shout outs shout so out shout outs to, to zoe you're fabulous thank you <laughs> i would also like to put a shout out to she's now a postdoc but my postdoc heather who brought me a hot chocolate this morning. Oh, now, wow. maybe less important Special for the people. scientific no, breakthrough. No, no. No, Very this important what to me. Is. This is what research <laughs> culture is about. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, so back to the blood brain barrier. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we, I love a site thing, but that is so exciting. Um, and so I feel that one thing we haven't discussed yet, actually, is the different cell types in the blood brain barrier. So I previously mentioned endothelial cells, so they make up sort of the main part of the vessel. So um, the blood-brain barrier sits in the 
blood microvessels in the brain and um so what am i doing here you can't see this because it's a podcast but if you're watching the video version i'm making a circle with my hand beautiful um thank you and <laughs> this is where the endothelial cells sit they make up this kind of circle and then but then they have pals that help them out so then they also have other cell types so they have pedocytes which are hmm, they're kind of how do you describe a pedocyte so everyone i work with is obsessed like as in who I collaborate with, is obsessed with parasites. And I like parasites, but I just can't love them as much as I love the endothelial cell. So I'm going to leave this to Sophie smiling. Sophie, <laughs> tell us about a parasite. Well, I think the key thing about parasites is they kind of wrap around the endothelial cells and they're involved in sort of changing the size of the blood vessels, the sort of constriction and, and, and opening of them. Um, and... Yeah, they actually cover most of the endothelial cells in some cases, don't they? And and I think, yeah, yeah. And... I I always I don't want to get in trouble, but I always think of them as a sort of type of smooth. Yes, I cell. do too, actually. But yes. then sometimes you speak to some people who love a parasite and they just they, they don't look like at you. <laughs> they, don't, they look at you really just really disappointed. They're just Why? like, oh. what do they want it to be? I th- I th- well, they are special, aren't they? they yeah, are I suppose they're so themselves. much smaller than just... Cells. Yeah, and, and if you knock out parasites, like if you get rid of them, big issues. Mm. But, as I said to one researcher who loves parasites, I was like, it doesn't it doesn't kill like, the <laughs> thing. Like, you can survive without parasites. Is this your you definition of special? You don't know <laughs> about it. <laughs> maybe i was like but you can't survive without the endothelial cells so maybe everyone's equally important i think so <laughs> so anyway we have the endothelial cells uh, which make up the the kind of the main part of the vessel we have the parasites which wrap around we have smooth va- smooth muscle vascular cells which um kind of are to do with constriction of vessels and then I can see Kate, I feel like because she's already mentioned them, we have, well, I was going to mention microglia. They don't really attach to the vessels, but they're, they're in there. They're in the mix. They're at the party. But we also have to mention the astrocytes. So the astrocytes, which are cells which have these lovely long feet, their feet stick on to the uh, vessels as well. And I actually think astrocytes are quite cool. They do a lot of kind of exchange of nutrients and other things with endothelial cells. And Kate's nodding. So tell us about astrocytes and the blood brain barrier. I actually have a confession to make in that I think I am one of those astrocyte ignorers. And I want to apologize <laughs> to astrocytes because oh, no. they often get overlooked. I don't know whether you guys agree, but it's often neurons, microglia, and obviously microglia beautiful neurons beautiful but i just feel like poor poor astrocytes like when we used to do our neurogenesis experiments we would stain up for astrocytes just so that we knew they were there we didn't really care (laughs) but actually they're really important structurally and they play a huge huge role in supporting you know the overall i call it skeleton but i'm probably not the correct word Mm. um you know, and making that really crucial link. Pretty much wherever a neuron or a microglia or an oligodendrocyte is doing something cool, there will be an astrocyte there being like, I got you, fam. I'll hold you. <laughs> I love that. They're like the support network. They're they like, are. I got you. They're like there's rock. A... See, I don't think they are overlooked at the moment, but I think that's because there's some really fabulous astrocyte work done at Edinburgh University in the Dementia Research Institute oh, there. Nice. Um by mm. um i know blanca does a lot of work there and um, they do some lovely work with astrocytes so i feel like there is people who are rooting for the astrocytes out there so don't worry kate okay but there is people better. there yep don't worry um but just, yeah they're great just wanted they the astrocytes great. to know that i do think they make a valuable contribution well now they know it's on a podcast so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now that we understand a little bit more about the sort of structure of the blood brain barrier and the different cell types and the roles that we play they play let's move on a little bit more to uh, your work in depth so let's start with sophie so you've had a recent publication in nature congratulations <laughs> you've made it you can now retire <laughs> um, <laughs> that's it pinnacle done nature publication. child prodigy um, <laughs> um so i would um love to hear more about that so your paper is around 
uh, micro bubbles. So yes. tell us more. Yeah, so um, I'll describe how it works. Basically, um, the the ultrasound, instead of using it normally and safely as it's, well, it is safe, but I'm just saying instead of using it normally uh, to sort of scan for babies or the inside of your body, um, basically you can use this safe technology in a completely different way, which involves focusing the ultrasound waves onto specific target. And what that means is that you can focus that target onto any way you want, and it can be small or larger. And in the brain, if you focus it onto even the really deep regions of the brain, you can essentially get anywhere in the brain you want with the ultrasound. If you inject the drug that you want to deliver across the blood-brain barrier and these tiny, tiny bubbles that have got a lipid or protein shell and a gas core, what happens is that the bubbles and the drug are everywhere in the body, but only where you focus the ultrasound into a specific region of the brain will the bubbles oscillate. And so they gently oscillate inside of the blood vessels. And what they do is they create mechanical forces on the endothelial cells and basically open up the blood brain barrier. Um, and this is this is super cool <laughs> essentially because because all the drugs that the novel drugs that you're making or the old drugs that haven't worked because they haven't gone through the blood brain barrier you could use this technology in a non-invasive way to open the barrier and it's temporary the barrier opens and then it closes up um, afterwards so it's kind of a, a non-invasive way of doing this and, and the publication that came out earlier this year that there was uh, a lot of it was done by uh, my student William Lee Key Chan and shout uh, out to the student again yes shout out to yeah. William <laughs> um, he's, his work is really showing that you can get all sorts of different sizes of drugs across into the brain really really small ones much larger proteins antibodies all the way to drug carriers like liposomes and nanoparticles um, so that was the, the key of that publication. Sorry, I know my mouth is wide open. <laughs> it's so cool. Oh I have two goodness. questions. I've one question for me is how specific are we talking when you say you can open the blood brain barrier in a specific region? Are we talking microns? Are we talking like a region of the brain? Yes, it's um it depends on the frequency of the ultrasound that you use. Um, in our experiments, we tend to open an area of about one times two millimeters, um, but it can be much larger. Like we can cover the whole like left hemisphere of say a mouse brain, for example. Um, but it it really depends on the transducer that you're using. So, but in the order of millimeters, and then you could move the target and focus a much larger area if you move it. Great. And when the barrier opens, is it kind of, is it almost anything could get through or is it kind of specific to what you're, the drugs that you've sort of putting in? Or? Yeah, um, it's, it's a mixture because really what's happening is you're getting gaps in between the cells. So the tight junctions are opening and depending on how much you're opening that, different sizes will be able to get through but you're also getting increased transport through the cells themselves and um there's drug flux pumps that are sort of toned down temporarily um so it's kind of three different things happening and so um no it's true that with some uh, depending on how much you're how much pressure you're putting in with the ultrasound waves um, you can get much larger open or much smaller so sometimes we'll do an opening where only up to a certain size of molecule will get across and not beyond that um, so size is a big factor so recently we've heard about um, novel treatments which are for the removal of amyloid from the brain and what i was wondering with your technique could you also maybe apply it and if you're creating these openings in the blood brain barrier could then we remove stuff like amyloid from the brain well that, that's well? very very interesting it's part of the research that my group is doing at the moment actually because um there are two things that can happen here one you're right you're opening the barrier so you can get stuff coming out 
my gut feeling is that you wouldn't be able to get everything to come out so only you know things nearby and that's super cool because you could use it as a liquid biopsy right you could take a blood sample after opening the barrier to be able to detect whether someone's got say a certain type of disease different stage or something like that so that's super cool direction of that research but what's interesting is that if you open the barrier, stuff goes in, not only your drug, but other blood derived proteins, etc. What that does is it elicits an activation of the microglia and the astrocytes. So they get sort of alerted, oh, there's something here, we need to clear it up. And actually what happens is that not only do they clear out the stuff that's moved into the brain, but also they start clearing the amyloid. <laughs> so that's what's really cool in the, the very recent research we're doing is that even if you just open the barrier without delivering a drug, the microglia are activating and trying to clear out more of the plaques. So it's almost like an alerting, you know, the brain of something. It's almost like a kickstart. Yes, yes, exactly. It's like telling the brain, yeah, it's almost, if the brain has almost become habituated to maybe a disease status. Yeah, it's ignoring it, it, yeah. Yeah, it's ignoring it because it's become the norm yeah. in the brain. But then if you shove something yeah. else in, it goes, Wake Whoa! it up. <laughs> Wake it up. And it's like, actually, I need to be doing something here. That's yeah. really, I love this stuff. This is so, so interesting. You see, Kate is also like, <laughs> loving this I'm stuff. I'm in love. <laughs> I'm just thinking, can you imagine, right, if you did your little liquid brain biopsy thing, I say little, it's amazing, it's groundbreaking. Yeah. Apologies, I don't mean little like no, that. No, no, don't worry. Because um, I don't know about you, but have you, are you guys ever involved in the big versus little soluble amyloid toxicity debate? So I'm wondering if you could look at what's released and go, well, in the patients that are, you know, declining much faster, does that liquid biopsy contain more or less soluble versus complete yeah. amyloid because obviously well people with who don't have any disease pathology also have brains riddled with amyloid at, yeah, in yeah, old yeah. age so we don't we could actually start understanding what on earth is going on yeah in my head that's it's the really first cool. question i'm just Very like what? <laughs> what? i think um so what i was going to ask sophie is how translatable is this to humans i know at dundee we got a new i know super exciting a, a new <laughs> sorry just we know it's a new um mri ultrasound machine here and there was some really fabulous fundraising to get it i think there's only two in the uk yes or yes. there's maybe three now yep. um and a lot of the work at dundee is actually being focused on um tremors and doing focused ultrasound to alleviate these tremors, which is, yeah. um, it's a different story, maybe not for today, but if you're out there, you should look it up. It's oh, it's amazing. Fantastic. It's like magic. It, it is. Um, so <laughs> yeah. is that the type of machine that yes, you could it's use? it's exactly the same one. You just add the bubbles, the micro bubbles and, and the drug injection. Maybe I need to do some life. introductions <laughs> with Sophie and the researchers the clinical researchers at dundee because so cool. if yeah if we can translate this stuff into humans it'd be so exciting I know, I know. and then maybe oh, one fabulous. day you can do like a little like device that you just put on for an hour after you've taken that is the drug. dream you imagine just yes. around your head portable yeah <laughs> Or like a sweat band a sweat band <laughs> and then you just and then it gives you the pulse and you, know, you take this just before a meal so you've not got too much sugar to go into your brain whilst doing exercise you increase neurogenesis after having your compound just let's rule everybody's lives protocol <laughs> sophie i feel like we could talk about your research forever That's but it. i also really want to hear about kate's Do research too yes, yes we of do. course so, so kate you're working <laughs> on drug targets yes. tell us about it oh goodness gracious I, after Sophie I just I don't know what to say um no, no you're making me amazing research. amazing drugs <laughs> that well, they are not amazing yet I'd love them to be amazing yet yeah so, so then this is why we have collaboration exactly Kate you make the drugs Sophie you get them in yeah the I'll get them across we could do this we could do this my life just got a whole lot easier thank you um <laughs> right, Kate tell us about it what are you yeah. up to so I guess maybe the thing that's maybe most important for for this podcast is actually our our sort of like ethos of interdisciplinary working so um it, drug discovery is classically when you're making the drugs it's classically a chemistry thing you have to design and make them if you're working on chemical drugs and not biologics but um one of the things that we're missing in 
neurodegenerative disease research is actually that translation which come up so many times today already you know this comes along and then we don't translate or this comes along and then we don't have the machine to translate it to humans or whatever um and one of the big early challenges is that translation between a disease hypothesis and then the ability to drug it you know once you've got your hypothesis there's a whole world of work that has to then go into validating that particularly in cell-based assays um because yeah. and the reason i bring this up is because the classical way of doing drug discovery is by picking one target and going we're going to make a drug for that and then in certain cancers and in monogenic diseases that works really well but we don't even know what's going on biolog biologically well enough yet in your degenerative diseases to do that so what we actually need is to look at the cellular change for now and maybe hit multiple targets at a time so that's what we work mm. in we work in um understanding the molecular mechanisms behind the disease and then trying to work out if it's druggable <laughs> so fantastic yeah we need collaborations with people right up and down the chain because that's the only way this is going to work yeah absolutely and um, yeah i think it's really exciting to talk to both of you because I love um, sort of treatment focused uh, research. I think, you know, we really need to push in the UK towards treatments. And I think that's where, even though the new treatments that have come out for dementia um, aren't perfect, I think it's a real signal to the governing bodies yeah. that with proper support um, and, you know, research money put into this, we actually could get there and get mm -hmm. really successful treatments um so it's restoring yeah, confidence any... isn't it absolutely because it's been so unsuccessful for pretty much the whole time it's been researched mm -hmm. in terms of alzheimer's disease it's i don't want to use the word failure because i don't believe it is a failure i feel like we've been building up a picture for decades now of yeah. what's going on and i feel like we're actually getting to the top of the mountain where we're starting to see the possibility of really life-changing treatments being developed. But we just need that extra push, that extra support with funding from um, at a government level, in my opinion, because we need big money invested to really get that push there. That and I just think, lovely. Yes, please. yeah, our, our charities do so much for us. I mean, yeah. I mentioned I'm funded by Alzheimer's Research UK. I would not be doing this work without them. Um, I think yourself, Sophie, you're funded through the Dementia Research Institute, yeah, which, which has a big charity yeah. funded component. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and yourself, Kate. Um, I've been lucky enough to get an um, Alzheimer's Research UK um, pilot project grant, which. Oh, that's amazing. Was charity money though. wonderful yes yeah. yeah i think all Char my money so has been charity money apart from the wonderful fellowship that newcastle gave me to start mm. my group fantastic so i think um yeah i think a big shout out to the charities who, thank who you. fund this research and, and keep us going thank you for taking so a punt on a chemist <laughs> research uk <laughs> uh thank you for taking a punt on someone who was doing diabetes research <laughs> it's so closely linked um, it is so closely linked and yeah i think for people who aren't familiar with the links between diabetes and alzheimer's uh, disease the figure that always sticks in my mind is that if you have type 2 diabetes you're twice as likely to go on and develop mm. alzheimer's disease Terrifying. so for me in my research it's understanding why that is because for me like a big bit a big fact like that we have to understand why that that is that's a solid bit of research um so for, why? Why? Can we do another one on in inflammation and discuss it? Oh, oh we're amazing. <laughs> Listen, I'm still waiting for the diabetes. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, so we're running out of time, sadly, but I'd like to just uh, finish up on, on a couple of questions. So what future developments do you both see um, in the field of blood brain barrier research and its importance in, in solving the problem of dementia so where would we like to see in the next five to ten years this kind of research goal i'll start with you sophie we've kind of touched on some of it yeah i mean i'd, I'd say um, basically getting it into patients so that it's a clinically approved treatment and that's kind of starting clinical trials have shown that it's safe to repeatedly do that in humans but um to actually you know get drugs across and show that therapeutic efficacy would be absolutely amazing yeah so basically you need to come to Dundee. Yeah. <laughs> about the machine. You've got to do it. Um, and Kate, what about yourself? Where would you like to see this? I would really like to see more collaboration between 
drug discovery scientists and specialists like Sophie to work out what we can make the most of in the blood brain barrier to get through because our biggest challenge is designing compounds that get through. It sounds like with a bit of clever design, we might be able to do it easier. Yeah. So I want to see more collaboration. Yeah. I think that would be fantastic. <laughs> yeah. That is exciting. And just to end on, we have a lot of um, early career researchers who listen to this podcast. So, um, Sophie, what advice would you give to any of the early career researchers listening on how to get into this field? Because you came in through a really uh, unique yeah. way. Yes, so a very odd way to get into it as an engineer. Um, I say, I don't, I, I suppose I'd say, please join. <laughs> if you're not joined already, please do. Because I it, the problem's so complex. There's so many challenges. Uh, the more there are of us, the better. And we really need people that have got completely different ways of working and mindsets. And really that diversity just makes everything a lot better and faster. So uh, I'd say, please join. If you're thinking Couldn't agree it. more. People from different backgrounds, different disciplines, we need different ways of thinking to solve the big problems. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And yourself, Kate, what advice would you give to any ECRs listening? I would say follow the butterflies. And what I mean is that little feeling in your stomach you get when you're onto something. That hold on to that. And if something about that excites you, I mean, I actually trained as a cancer research person but now I'm I don't know I got butterflies when I thought about the brain and then you know it's really rewarding and trust that gut because even if you can't articulate it yet your subconscious has made some links and has made a scientific hypothesis so trust that in yourself and do what interests you I love that absolutely and my last question so I asked this in the vascular podcast that I did um, a while ago but I've already said my favorite blood brain barrier cell type. <laughs> Big shout out to the endothelial cells. What's your favorite cell type in the blood brain barrier? Sophie? Um, I'd be torn between microglia and astrocytes. So I'd probably go for astrocytes because I know maybe Kate might say microglia. <laughs> <laughs> You're keeping all the cells happy. Kate, what's your favorite blood brain barrier I was about to go type? to astrocytes to make me feel better. <laughs> the microglia is sad somewhere. oh sorry parasites parasites oh parasites. covered it all no, <laughs> jokes parasites oh. have enough fans absolutely microglia parasites remind me parasites remind me of that that cool alternative indie band <laughs> it makes me think <laughs> of like... periscopes oh lots <laughs> of so submarines like sticking their head above the parapet being like is everything okay do we need to open open any gates <laughs> I'm so no? sorry okay. for the listeners. <laughs> Love it. For myself. <laughs> That's fantastic. So we've got a couple of Astrocyte fans. Um, and you were worried that nobody cared. <laughs> there you go. I'm going to stick with endothelial cells because I think I'm yet to hear someone else say that. Stick but, to your um, guns. You follow those principles. I love that. They're such hard workers. They are shuffling oh, things yeah. back and They forth. are grafters. Oh, they are grafters. And I respect that. Um, on that note... <laughs> I think that's all we have time for today. Um, but if anyone listening can't get enough of this topic, visit the Dementia Researcher website where you'll find a full transcript, biographies on our guests, blogs, and much more on this topic. And I would just like to take a second to thank our incredible guests, Dr. Kate Harris and Dr. Sophie Morris. I'm Fiona McLean, and you've been listening to the Dementia Researcher podcast. Bye. 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 The Dementia Researcher podcast was brought to you by University College London with generous funding from the UK National Institute for Health Research, Alzheimer's Research UK, Alzheimer's Society, Alzheimer's Association and Race Against Dementia. Please subscribe, leave us a review and register on our website for full access to all our great resources. Dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk